it's in our gardens, in our orchards, in, in, uh, in every town, and, but they are also in the forests. In fact, uh, uh, someone once asked me, so what do you study? And I said, the bonnet macaque. And he said, oh, I thought you were a wildlifer. So I think that's the story, the very sorry story of the bonnet macaque. Uh, but today I'll take you on a slight, a bit of a detective story, when we try to understand what is really happening to the species as it interacts with people, because that's a very important part of its evolutionary history. Uh, we have records from the Tamil Sangam poetry, which says that about 2,000 years ago, there were bonnet monkeys living in the town's commons on a jackfruit tree. So clearly they have evolved with people over these years, but today it's a bit of a difficult situation that they find themselves in. So, and I wanted to ultimately draw attention to whether the species, which is a pest, a weed species that nobody wants, may actually be there, where they may slowly but quietly disappear. So, uh, very briefly, uh, I think we all know that this is a species that has very successfully adapted to almost any kind of environment, natural, man-made. They are found in a whole variety of environments from scrub jungles to deciduous forest to rainforest. Almost every town and city in South India, south of the Godavari and south of the Tapti have bonnet macaque populations. It also has a very interesting tendency to move towards human habitations and it becomes more terrestrial rather than stay up in the trees, and which is why a very close friend of mine, who some of you might know, Shankar Raman, once said that Rana is the only primatologist I know who looks down and studies his monkeys. So, uh, so it does become very terrestrial. Um, but it has now reached a situation where if you go into many of the protected forests, including, let's say, Bandipur, where we work, you find the troops of completely wild bonnets are almost rare. Uh, most of them line up along the roads, and if any of you have traveled from Mysore to Uti, uh, you would have seen, in, as you cross Bandipur and Mudumalai, troops of macaques by the roadside. And, uh, of course, over time, there has been a rather intense love-hate relationship that the people of the South have shared with this macaque, and that itself is an interesting situation, because on one hand, we bow down to them, we pray to them, but on the other hand, we have no problems driving them away, sometimes even killing them when they become too much of a uh, difficulty. Uh, the apparently successful coexistence that bonnet macaques seem to have with the local people in uh, non-forest habitats uh, seem to belie the fact that because of the intensification of agriculture in rural areas and our increasing intolerance that we have towards them in our urban areas may be leading to a very steady decline of these populations. And uh, so uh, what we wanted to do was actually conduct a project. This project was, of course, aimed to understand the biology of the species. It's a 25-year project. Uh, and we are currently in our 15th year, uh, and I will present some data here, the story that I was telling you about, for, and the data from here comes for these 13 years, that we've been regularly monitoring a population of these macaques. And the questions that we asked is, what are the changes in their society and behavior brought about particularly by interactions with humans, which may possibly be leading to their population declines. We did not have, and we do not have any data on their declines, but other researchers, including Professor Mewa Singh of Mysore University, and our group have been strongly feeling over many years now that perhaps the species is declining. And secondly, are these human macaque interactions that we see in the city, are they also affecting them in their forests, in the forests themselves, which are, of course, protected for their wildlife. Of course, nobody cares about the bonnet macaque. If you go to any of these forest offices and look at the list of uh, wildlife, the macaque never figures in it. And that's but possibly because you know, we are so familiar with them, we don't consider them uh, a wildlife species at all. Now, very briefly, I'll tell you a bit about the species. Uh, they are found only in South India, they have a very wide ecological distribution. They usually live in multi-male, multi-female groups with variable troop sizes. Females are what are called philopatric, which means they live in their troops where they are born all their lives uh, and set up very strong linear dominance hierarchies in adulthood. Males tend to move from one troop to another, some of them moving permanently, some of them transiently, and 
there are males who never move at all. They have very unstable dominance hierarchies, and they have a variety of strategies to take care of uh, their positions in the hierarchy, aggression, coalitions, affiliations, and sexual uh, behavior is it's a promiscuous society with periodic guarding of females, ample mating opportunities, mutual tolerance among males, and as in many other species, very, very subtle female mate choice. Now, uh, the, the two points I wanted to make from this. First is that if you look at all the points that I've written here, you will see usually, generally, inv not invariable, which shows that this is a remarkably adaptable species. It's, it shows tremendous variability in its ecological adaptability, in its behavioral uh, profiles, and that makes it a fascinating species to understand. The other point I wanted to make is you will see on the right uh, five males who come from five different troops uh, in Bandipur, and uh, you can easily make them out. And that's another important part of our work. We need to identify individuals. And in the 15 years now, we know about 1,600 individuals by face. Uh, we don't tag them. We just know them by face. Of course, some of them have died. Some have moved. Others are being born. And it's an easy task because, as you can see, their hairstyles are very different. But their behavior and life history strategies, we now realize, are also very different. So one of the philosophical aspects of our work is really to identify individuals and show that individuality is extremely important, as in perhaps many other species which go largely unrecognized. So if you've seen one bonnet monkey, you haven't seen them all. You've just seen one. Um, OK, so this is Bandipur. I won't spend any time. Our work is entirely along the highway uh, in the tourist zone of the park. And one of the surprises that came up to us when we went there 15 years ago is that we found that a very large proportion of the troops in this uh, population had a very unique social organization. Typically, as I said, bonnet macaques have multi-male, multi-female, but here were a large number of troops which were with one single adult male and a few adult females, and they're young. Now, unimale troops, and I'll call them unimale troops, have never been reported earlier from these populations, and when I went back to other records, I found very small proportions of this kind of organization in bonnet macaque populations. And again, just one or two features of these groups. As I said, they are stable groups. They've, they last for long periods of time. They have one adult male with a few adult females. The total group size is smaller than that of the multi-male groups. And they are found only in the forested tracks, whereas multi-male groups occur in both forests and around human habitations. And so the question is, and that was the detective story, is why are there so many unimale troops in this population that have never been seen in other populations? And uh, so we constructed what is called a model. And I'll briefly go to the model and the rest of my talk. I will just give you some evidence which seem to point out to us that this model may be correct. Right, so basically what we argued is that there were two factors, the natural food in dry season, which is sparse and patchy in a typical deciduous forest like Bandipur, but more importantly, provisioned food from tourists who throw out food to these monkeys may be the reason why there is now intense competition amongst the females of the group. And we hypothesized that maybe to avoid competitions, female may be splitting up, may be dividing up, which is very rare, because this species belongs to that very large group of primates which are called female bonded. Females live all their lives together. So it would be very unusual if the females had to uh, split. and. Maybe when you have a small group of females, if this is really true, maybe they were being guarded by a single adult male, and this may have led to the unimale social organization. And so the first question that we asked is, do provision food from tourists, which is rich and which is very localized, does it really lead to intense competition between females? Now, what we found, and I'm just summarizing some of the evidence, is we find that the forest troops have a much larger home range than do the provision troops. That was an indication that perhaps in, for in the forest, you have to search much more over large uh, areas, whereas when you're provisioned, you find food relatively easier. And as I said, provisioned troops also had easier access to richer human origin foods. Second, we found that multi-male troops increased their home range very much during the dry season. 
Dry season as food is scarce, and perhaps the multi-male troops needed to increase their home range because they needed to find more food. And the larger troops typically were more food limited, especially at the times of scarcity. And finally, when we looked at inter-troop interactions, we found that there was, don't bother about these technical terms, there are two kinds of competition that uh, monkeys show. One is what is called scramble competition, where when one troop is moving towards a second troop, this troop retreats. So there is no direct physical conflict, but they make way for each other. That is called scramble competition. And the other is contest competition where they fight physically. And both these kinds of competition were displayed by provision troops at much higher rates than by forest troops. And the inter-troop encounters were invariably initiated by multi-male troops. So this, therefore, suggested that indeed and we have more evidence, which I'm not talking about, where we have shown that one particular troop, which during the day is, feeds on natural resources in the forest, but in the evening when tourists come down from Uti into Mudumalai, they start offering food to the monkeys. Within that span of the day, aggression between females goes up almost seven to tenfold. So there's intense competition for these food resources. Now, when that happens, what is uh, the outcome. Okay, so I think I have more data here. Again, don't bother about these graphs. In the first graph here, we've shown the multi-male troops and uh, how they change their aggression when they go from natural food resources to human origin food resources. And the, on the x-axis are these different aggressive behaviors. The bottom graph is for unimale troops. And what I wanted to highlight is that when you find provisioning, that is, when people give out food, the last behavior, which is FS, feeding supplants, where a female is holding on to a food, another female attacks her and takes away that food, feeding supplants increases significantly both, uh, in, in both multi-male troops, shown in the upper graph, but there is no increase in feeding supplants in the unimale troops. So clearly, the number of females matters. We also looked at the effect of seasonality. So what would happen in the dry season? And what you find is that there is a significant increase in aggression in the dry season, but only in the upper graph. All the kinds of aggression that they can potentially show increases in the dry season, but only in the multi-male groups and not in the unimale groups, which are shown in the bottom graph. So this, therefore, told us that there was indeed intense competition between females within the troops, but is this what was leading to smaller groups of females? And what we then found, and here again I summarize our data, we find that seven of the 30 troops that we were observing from March 2000 to September 2011 have split. In other words, you have females who live together in a group, but they break somewhere in between and they go their separate ways. And if you look at uh, the more detailed uh, analysis, if you do an analysis of the troops, you'll find about 25 to 60% of the females exhibited fission, usually accompanied by one or more adult or subadult males and their dependent young. And this kind of high group fission has rarely been reported in any female bonded primate species anywhere in the world. In, in fact, again, I show uh, the actual data. What we find is if you look at what is written in red, we looked at both emigration, where females leave a group, or immigration, when females come into a group, almost 43 or 33 percent, 33 to 43 percent of the groups experience female emigration or immigration, and 2 to 3 percent of the females over their lifetime will leave. So therefore, what we find is that perhaps because of this intense competition between the females within the troops, there is not only group fission with females leave leaving, but individual females also sometimes leave the group and go and join other groups. And this therefore leads to a small group of females. And then the question is, are these small groups of females being monopolized by a single adult male? And in the next slide, what I show is something that we think is quite remarkable and we can discuss this uh, later, which is that we compared the behavioral profile of the single male in a unimale group with the alpha male, or the most dominant male in a multi-male group of males. And we looked at several categories of behavior, which I will point out one by one. And yeah, so that's the comparison, because they should be roughly comparable. 
And what we find is, if you look at reproductive monopolization, it's complete in the unimale group. So in other words, all the females mate with that one single male. There may be subadult males, and we'll come to that, but they do not get an opportunity to mate. Whereas in the alpha male, of course, there are other males who get a chance to mate with the females, so there is no reproductive monopolization. Secondly, if you look at aggression towards the other subadult and juvenile males in the group, the single male in a unimale group shows regular and intense aggression, which is rare and mild, as coming from the alpha male in a multi-male group. There is active herding of females by the single male, which is absent in the multi-male groups. There is very, very aggressive troop defense by the single male. And all cases of death that we have seen in Bandipur, where a male has been killed, has been by the single male of a unimale group. But it's completely different in the case of a multi-male group. When there's an inter-troop encounter, the alpha male of the multi-male group sits on a high tree along with the other females watching the subordinate males fight it out. It really reminds you of these famous miniature paintings, maybe from the Jaipur or Kangra school, where you have the emperor and his harem watching his soldiers die. And it's a bit like that. And so therefore, it's the prerogative of the alpha male never to be able to fight. I mean, he doesn't want to fight. But the single male, the uni male group, doesn't have a choice. And when there is immigration of other males into the group, you find that there is active prevention of immigration by the single male because clearly he has a lot to lose. The alpha male in a multi-male group will never prevent other males from coming in. Now, what is remarkable about these stark differences is are these actually genetic differences across these individuals? Are these learned individuals? Do individuals learn over the course of their lifetime? Or are these cultural traditions where you watch and you behave in a particular way? Or do you have this behavioral flexibility that you could take on a different role, a different behavioral profile, depending on where you are? We don't have answers to this, but hopefully over the long term, we may get some hints as to what could be the mechanism. But coming back to our story, therefore, there is indeed monopolization of reproduction by a single male in the unimale group, and this perhaps is what has led to the unimale social organization. But the point that I want to make here, therefore, is that, and I will come back later at the end of my talk to this, is that this entire process, which is a very significant process from the point of view of the species biology, from the point of view of management of the species, from the point of view of their long-term survival, this has been brought about essentially by people. Right. Now, there are two issues which I thought are fascinating and which I thought I'll share with you. There are two important issues that in, these, in this story that we think impacts uh, the life history strategies of these monkeys. The first is what is called phenotypic flexibility. Now, it's a very common belief that when we see variation in behavior in humans, it must be brought about by culture, by learning, by our environment. We don't rule out, of course, that some of it may be genetic. And of course, scientists tend to believe more in genetics than do the non-scientists. Uh, but clearly, it's a story of an interaction. Unfortunately, when we talk about monkeys or we talk about any non-human species, our entire belief is that it is driven by genetics. Now, clearly, nothing could be further from the truth. And we need to do long-term studies on different species to understand how this happens. And I just wanted to show you one slide about what, is what I've called phenotypic flexibility in social behavior. And this comes from the story that I told you. Now, this is a complex slide, but I'll go slowly through it. So what I've suggested is if on the top you see there is unpredictability in food abundance and distribution, which has two effects. You have flexibility in female social strategies. You also have group fission and female emigration on the right, on the top, leading to smaller group sizes. Now, that particular event of group fission and female emigration has two impacts. You have a flexibility in male behavioral and emigration strategies when they track these females. There is also a story of a skewing of the sex ratio of offspring by males or females, which I will not go into, but I can, if anyone's interested, I can talk about it later. And this flexibility in male behavioral strategies leads to flexibility in female emigration strategies. Because effectively, I'll tell you in one line what happens. When a female finds herself in a unimale group, whereas she has always evolutionally been in a multi-male group, she suffers from one major problem, mate choice. There is only one male 
who bullies her into mating with him. And so we believe that one of the reasons why females are leaving is because they want to find newer mates. And thus, the germ of this uh, discovery actually goes back to a very, very wonderful primatologist, a wonderful man whom we lost recently, Dr. Rao Fali, whom some of you may have met. And Rao Fali, in his PhD thesis in the 1970s, had predicted that female bonnet macaques would one day show immigration, and he's right. He's very, very right. But anyway, that's another story. And the second issue I wanted to pull out, and I want to show a little video clip about this, is that we now have discovered that many of these behavioral traits that bonnet macaques show is culturally passed down from one generation to another. In other words, we are now talking of cultures. Now, Jane Goodall discovered uh, chimpanzee cultures. There have been very, very few studies on monkeys. And our study seems to show that bonnet macaques have a very elaborate social culture. Right? And again, I don't have time to spend on this. But very briefly, what is culture? Basically, these are individual behavioral traits. So for example, whether I eat with my spoon or a fork, or whether I eat with my hands, these behavioral traits have been produced either by accident or individual learning but they give rise through social learning into a tradition. And this generates individuality. I mean, nobody denies that much of in human individuality is determined by culture, and we now think it's true for the monkeys as well. And there are three kinds of behavioral patterns that you see in these traditions. You have rapid spread patterns, where a behavior can spread over an entire population. And so you see this, good, Jane Goodall showed that two chimpanzee populations on either side of the river Congo have very different ways of termite fishing. So one population, the individuals would insert the stick into the termite mound, and when the termite stick on, uh, bite onto the stick, she takes it out and runs it through her mouth. On the other side of the Congo, they pull out the stick with the termites, but they run it through the forefinger and their thumb of the other hand and put it into their mouth. Now this is a cultural tradition because you can see that young learn from their parents, or from their mother, or from other individuals. And that's what is the second type, which is called the parent-offspring patterns, where there is vertical within lineage transmission. You can also have group-specific patterns, where there is horizontal, ver vertical, and oblique transmission, where one part of the group develops certain behaviors that the other parts of the group may not have. Now, this is to, just to summarize what we mean by culture. But what is important, and perhaps I don't have time now, is we have now documented a whole range of behavioral traditions in bonnet macaques in Bandipur. Each of these are worthy of their own investigations and will require long-term studies, but they are extremely variable. So I will show you a clipping after this of what we've called mango washing, where they actually wash mangoes, uh, which are raw or sometimes ripe, but uh, which are wild mangoes that come floating down the river. Interactions with people seems to have led to certain novel behaviors, bipedal begging, seen on the top right, car raiding, a very complex behavior, male adoption, where we have seen two subadult males in two different troops at two different times actually adopt an orphan young. Such adoption, adoption and the females never adopted in both these cases. So such a case of an adoption of an infant by an adult male has never been reported in any primates, including apes, so we think. And we see some evidence that this may be learned by younger members of the group. But again, I don't have time to talk about it. Uh, there are also calls, what we call coo call begging, where a female learned how to make coo calls to beg food from people, and only her young show this pattern. No, none of the other juveniles show it. There could be also differences in allo grooming patterns, in foraging styles, all of which seem to be transmitted culturally. So here is a, a video, and I hope this works. Uh, this is basically of two brothers, and one of them has picked up a mango which came floating down the river, and he washes it. And now uh, you will see that as he washes it, he will remove a speck of something. Uh, so we think we wash it. Uh, he washes it because of the sap. There, he will now remove something with his left hand, and he will wash his hand in the water. There, so he uses water as a tool, and then he bites into it, and then he loses it, 
and then he looks for it. And this is also cognitively interesting because he clearly has a model, a visual model or a touch model by which he's searching for it. And he doesn't seem to find the mango. And then suddenly he finds it and washes it again. Now, uh, thanks. So what I wanted to point out here is that, of course, it's cognitively interesting, the behavior, and uh, I won't go into that. But culturally, th this was a group of five males, five brothers, who left a group. We tracked them. They spent about two, two and a half months by the river Moyar, which at some part dis uh, divides Mudumalai from Bandipur. And only two of the five brothers actually learned how to wash mangoes. We don't know whether they learned from each other or whether they both independently learned it. But what's interesting is that the other three brothers never washed mangoes. Two and a half months later, these five brothers went back out of the river zone. Each of them joined a different troop. Four of these five brothers in the next three, four years became alpha males. In the groups they joined, but they never washed mangoes again simply because they never found themselves next to a river anymore. So that also tells you how fickle culture can be. Given a lack of opportunity, culture can die out, as we know in the case of humans as well. So I would like to sort of conclude uh, to say that human interactions with macaques, including this very simple act of feeding, which is actually considered a very benevolent act, and we would love to feed the monkeys because we think we are doing good to them, can have very profound effects on them. And we've seen at two levels that of the society, which changes in structure, as well as that of the individual. And bonnet macaques, however, are remarkable. They are a remarkable species. We've been studying them for 23 years now. And we find that the kind of social flexibility they have, the ability to adapt new behavioral strategies and traditions that are established through social learning have possibly allowed them to adapt very, very well, not only to different ecological uh, uh, habitats, but also to people. But the question then is, where are they going? What is next? And what we find is that when we looked at our unimail groups in uh, from the period 2000 to 2011, we've lost seven of these 11 unimail troops. They have died out. We've seen all the individuals die, but, and the troops have therefore died out, but none of the 10 multimail groups that we originally identified in 2000 have disappeared. They're all very much there. Uh, therefore, we think there are two sets of processes. One is stochastic and the other that's biological, that is possibly responsible for this differential survival of these two forms of organization. The stochastic process is simply this. If there is an accidental death, either to a tourist car or if they fall uh, to a leopard, it could jeopardize the entire survival of the group. Because even if there's a group of just four or five individuals and two or three of them die, then the other two don't survive very long. Right? So that is a stochastic or a statistical sort of uh, process. But there is also a biological process that perhaps sets into motion. The first is that the single male, the uni male, has an extremely despotic behavior. And that can lead to increased, potentially costly emigration of young males from the group. We have seen that sub Adults and juvenile males in unimale groups leave very, very early. They are almost driven away by the single male, and many of them can fall prey to leopards because they are inexperienced, because they are on their own. And therefore, clearly, there is a dwindling of individuals in these groups. Secondly, the immigration of females from unimale groups, driven perhaps, as I said, by a lack of female mate choice, may also be a process which can lead to increased mortality of these females and the repeated fission that I was talking about into these small, unstable groups may ultimately affect the survival of a significant number of individuals in this population. And therefore, we do think that even uh, in the wild, where all species are protected, perhaps many of these populations are threatened. And it's not only in the urban and semi-urban areas, but we need to really focus also on what's actually happening in forests. And finally, we do need, I think, effective management strategies for the species in protected areas, particularly with tourist macaque interactions and in rural and urban areas where there is very severe human macaque conflict, because I think we will, if we don't manage these problems, we are going to lose the species. 
perhaps in another 20 years or so. Thank you very much. And I wanted to thank a few of my colleagues over these years with whom I've been working, a number of organizations which has supported this work, a number of funding agencies and the, the forests and the university where we began this work. Thank you. Thank you, Rana.